I want to welcome you all today to, um, to today's Global Existential Challenges Seminar. My name is Deborah Yashar. I think I know most of you in the room, but I'm the director of Pierce and also a professor in the politics department and in SPIA. Today is the seventh uh, in our seminar series this year focused on global existential challenges. And we are here today in particular to talk about one of the most important existential challenges facing us today. Um, which is environmental challenges and sustainable sustainability. This is obviously a very capacious topic. We could spend many, many seminars talking about this. It's also an incredibly sobering theme that poses one of the underlying and most pressing issues facing the globe. Challenges to our planet, challenges to people, challenges to species, and so many other things. Touching us all, although arguably with differential and unequal effects, requiring us not only to understand how we got here, but also what we can do going forward. As we know, this has mobilized all kinds of communities, activists, not just youth, although youth, and there will be a conference tomorrow uh, on these sets of issues here, not only activists, but also activists along with broader epistemic communities of academics and policymakers and the like, who are trying to think about a way forward. So before I introduce our speakers, I just want to note there are many events that are taking place on campus addressing these sorts of issues, not only at Pierce, although also at Pierce, um, including the Climate and Conservation Summit that I just noted. The Brazil Lab is also organizing something tomorrow on indigenizing power, which has relations to this topic. The Fung program has organized many such events, including one this afternoon on sustainability, looking at shaping African-Asia partnerships. And um, the list could go on. Normally at these events, I say some opening comments, trying to situate the topic overall. But we have so many speakers today that I really want to limit my comments by just introducing the speakers and then ceding the floor to them. We are incredibly fortunate today to have four terrific colleagues, obviously, who need no introduction. But I'm going to do a little bit of the formality here. I think what's exciting is not only that each of them on their own has done phenomenal work, but also that they come from different disciplines. So we have a real opportunity today to hear from people with a background in geoscience and, and in engineering and in psychology and in anthropology. And the four of them together, but also individually, are really brilliant uh, intellectual leaders, innovative teachers, and dogged and creative public um, uh, engaged uh, um, scholars who bring their scholarship not just to the classroom, but also to these public stages. So let me introduce them very briefly. We're going to start off with Michael Oppenheimer, the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs and the High Meadows Environmental Institute and Director of CPRI, the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment. He's going to speak about the challenges of adapting to climate change, looking at both the global north and the global south. He will be followed by Anu Ramaswamy, the Sanjay Swamy, 87 professor of India Studies and a professor of civil and environmental engineering, the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, uh, Pierce, and the High Meadows Environmental Institute. She's also the director of the Chata Center for Global India. And she will be speaking about urban regions as drivers of innovation, as well as environmental challenges. Third, Elka Weber is the Gerhard R. Anlicker Professor in Energy and Environmental Professor of Psychology in the School of Public and International Affairs. She's also the Associate Director for Education of the Anlicker Center for Energy and the Environment and the Director of the Flung Global um, uh, Fellows Program here at Pierce. And she's going to speak about global existential challenges from both a risk and decision-making perspective and looking at climate change in particular as a leading example. And last but not least is Ron Beale, the Susan Dodd Brown Professor of Anthropology, the Chair of the Department of Anthropology, and also the Director of Pierce's Brazil Lab. And he will be speaking about the Amazonian tipping points and the challenges for the Lula government, as well as for indigenous peoples. So we have a lot to speak about. Each of them could fill the full hour and a half. And so I want to say without further ado, we're going to turn to them. I just want to re reiterate a few things. Each speaker will have about 12 to 15 minutes. If you see me going like this, it's um, I'm not asking a two finger. I'm just letting them know um, where we are in terms of time. That will be followed by Q&A, where the speakers will come up. Um, and all of this is being taped. So again, uh, as you're listening and speaking, just remember um, 
that uh, this is a, a taped set of discussions. So I want to welcome our speakers. Michael Oppenheimer will start off, and please give them a warm welcome. OK, all right. So I spent most of the beginning of my career that I was devoting to climate change on the question of how to limit it, how to avert it, how to get countries to agree to um, cooperatively handle it, how to get the US government to agree to do anything about it. And um, you know, there's been some progress in that direction, clearly. And in fact, in many ways, one can be optimistic about the, um, the impending, whoops, that timer should not be on. This is going to slow me down. I can't speak as fast as the timer wants me to go. I'll just do it from here. So, um, uh, so there have been changes. There's an impending energy revolution. Princeton is uh, neck deep in figuring out the uh, intellectual part of it or the uh, expert part of it. And there, we're going to see big changes in, in the world in that way. But is it enough? And with the understanding that it's probably not enough, that is, if you consider enough to be meeting the Paris goals of one and a half or two degree warming above pre-industrial levels, and uh, even, uh, even a slightly higher temperature, uh, the likelihood is we're not going to make it in that sense. So there's going to be a gap between the aspiration to control emissions and limit warming and what we're actually able to do. That gap is already why has already uh, opened up. People are already suffering the consequences of not just uh, climate events or climate trends, but climate tre events and trends related to climate change. Things that would not have happened without the buildup of the greenhouse gases. Boy, this is making me talk fast. So um, I'm going to quickly more, uh, walk through some of the. Th things I learned as I reoriented my own understanding and my own expert uh, uh, view and my own research and teaching in the direction of focusing more on adaptation. What do we do about this growing gap between the climate as we knew it and the climate as, as it is now manifesting? And how do we protect people? How do we protect property? How do we come out the big the sort of beginning of the manifestation of the climate problem, uh, uh, how do we come out the other end some decades down so that humanity on the whole is in better and not worse shape? So I have a few examples here of how we currently deal with adapting to climate change, focusing not so much on trends but on events. And if you look at how we've adapted to events in the past, it's and then you frame it in terms of how fast the changes are coming at us, uh, we have a lot of work to do, let's put it that way. So here's a slide I love to show. I know Elka was at a presentation about eight or 10 years ago when I showed this. I'm going to show it again. And I'm going to show it until things change. This is a slide of the flood risk to New York City um, at, at the time that Hurricane Sandy hit, 10, 11 years ago, creating a very destructive flood which killed in the city about 30 some odd people, and resulted in $20 billion of uh, insurable damage. Uh, we don't really know what the total number is. Um, it, the, the graph is this. It's a bar graph of the heights of coastal floods from, on the far right, Hurricane Sandy, the biggest one by far, about four foot above any previous flood. Uh, and the other nine floods, uh, going back to 1950 in the 60 previous years, which, uh, which were, as I said, considerably lower, but they were still big floods. And if you notice, there's a dashed line across there, which is the level at which the subway system floods. Why do I care about the subway system flooding? If you looked at all the systems from New York City that matter, the subway system ranks right up there with the water supply system as something that keeps the city going. Now, you could you notice that the Sandy flood was about three and a half foot above the level that keeps the subway uh, uh, keeps the subway from flooding. The subway had never flooded, and so you might say one lesson from that grave is all right. Sandy was so unusual that the subway flooded. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising decision makers uh, hadn't done anything to prevent that from happening. But you notice that there were th 
and eight, nine floods before that in the period from 1950, the post-World War II period, where the subway almost flooded, where the flood levels came within half a foot, a foot at most, uh, a foot and a half, maybe a foot and three quarters, and almost got into the subway. And the reason this is important is when you get flood waters in the subway, it's salt water when you get coastal flooding. Salt water corrodes the, particularly the signal systems very rapidly. The signal systems are irreplaceable because they're 100 years old and not much work has been done on them in the meantime. And you can't go to the hardware store and buy the components off the shelf. And it was, it was a combination of diligent work on, the, on um, the part of the emergency workers and the fact that there was at least some kind of system in place for pumping out the subway that the, um, the system was saved. It was shut down only for four days. Uh, and we got it back without having have to have it shut down for maybe six months or a year, which would have been a disaster. So that, to me, tells me the other lesson. The other lesson wasn't, the, the first lesson is Sandy's really unusual. The other lesson is it wasn't so unusual that the city should not have known without Sandy, even if Sandy never happened. These other floods came very close to possibly destroying a large part of the system. Of course, once water gets underground and into the system in uh, sufficient amounts, it finds the lowest level. It's going to flow, probably flow away from the spot where it first landed, and there's going to be trouble. And the fact that the decision makers in New York City had never even thought about this, to me, when I saw this graph, which the city itself posted in a postmortem of what went wrong in preparing for Sandy, is shocking. I've lived in that city most of my life. It is incomprehensible that with the resources, both financial and intellectual, available, uh, with all these politicians always having forward-looking agendas, supposedly, that nothing, and I mean nothing, was done to protect the system. The risk was well known, but it was ignored. That's a story which repeats itself again and again, and not just in the New York, not just in the United States, but around the world when it comes to climate-related risks. Nothing stimulates action like extreme damage, and, but such events are rare in a stable climate. That's why we don't learn very much from them sometimes. It takes a big one to get people's attention. It takes a big one so people remember, or at least uh, people who have some history with the system, of whatever it is, remember that this has happened before maybe and could happen again. But really, political action for a variety of reasons, is almost impossible at a high level, high enough level, unless there's a significant event. This is a history in Northern Europe, too. This was the, um, the aftermath of the North Sea storm in 1953. A couple of thousand people died in the UK and the Netherlands. And it led to some very forward-looking and substantial flood improvement projects. The current coastal defenses in the Netherlands, uh, you know, supposedly coastal defense in the Netherlands is at least 500 years old, but after the dismal first half of the 21st of the 20th century with two world wars and a depression and who knows what else, uh, Netherlands had let the, um, the so-called dikes deteriorate and they, after this flood with so many people dying, they built the modern system at the same time uh, the Thames barrier was constructed, which protects London and parts of the basin up, um, uh, down river from London. You can see it when you uh, fly over in an airplane, if you ever do, into Heathrow. A lot of times they fly right over it. You can get a bird's eye view of it, literally. Um, but that project would not have gotten done without this uh, monumental flood. And here's the other lesson. Both sets of construction Take it, it took at least 30 years to complete. It took 29, uh, about 29 years to do the Thames barrier from the beginning of planning to completion, uh, 45 years actually to complete the defenses in the Netherlands. So remember that not only do people wait too long, but once they act, it's not like they're protected right away. There are decades. And with climate changing, that means that events that are big enough to cause this kind of damage are going to come more and more frequent. The space between events is going to shrink. 
Here's an example of that from this figure. This deals with extreme heat events. Uh, the uh, left-hand panel is the so-called 10-year event, an event that happens only once a decade. Uh, the, the other is a 50-year event. This is average for the Northern Hemisphere, by the way, is what the statistics are. And you notice that already, compared to so-called pre-industrial times, 1850 to 1900, the once in 10-year event now occurs. Whoops. I'm sorry. I really should have remembered to do this before. I right. now likely to do the once a decade event now occurs three times a decade. If we were so lucky as to make the Paris target four times a decade, if we are so lucky as to make the less aggressive Paris target of two degrees, 5.6 times a decade, you're getting close eventually to once a year by the time you get into the three to four degree range. That means that when you get ready to prepare for an event, when an event hits you and you think, uh-oh, we need a defense against that, and this same kind of calculus is true for extreme floods, coastal floods, freshwater floods, and a number of other climate-related events, it's just the periods are different. You know, once the event hits and you all of a sudden have the political will together to do something about it, you know, it takes 10, 15, 20 years to get everything in place particularly not so much for heat events, for which there is in some sense a quick fix. I'll get to that in a minute. But for these other things that require moving people out of the way or building huge infrastructure, you cannot do that overnight. And in the meantime, the next big event is already coming down the bowling alley at you. And you're one of the pins, basically. And there's not enough time eventually to really get ready. So how do you do it? We don't have an answer for this yet. But somehow, we have to speed up the processes that relate to thinking ahead, planning. Uh, right now, even if you're thinking ahead and planning, you still have to wait for a nasty event to happen because the political will isn't there. All of this has to change. And then let me show this, which brings up another problem um, related. Not only are the events getting more rapid uh, in their appearance, but the distribution of impact is getting, I think, progressively more skewed. This is a wonderful figure that the Washington Post put together uh, a few days ago, actually. And it shows the heat-related risk and how it will change in the future, or I should say temperature-related risk. Because we have, we have people in the current world dying both from too much cold and too much heat. Depends on where you live. Almost done. Good. Um, and if you, live in the, uh, if you live in a part of the world that, uh, where you're going to see a decrease in extreme cold in the future, and at the same time, if you live in a relatively wealthy country where you can get greater adaptation, and... The, you know, ex places where extreme cold will decrease and where there's a lot of adaptation capability if we only employed it tends to be richer countries versus if you live in a hot part of the world where the, the mortality rate from a temperature is on the heat side and is likely to increase rather than decrease in the future, you wind up, you, you, if you identify those countries, they tend to be poor. So the, the countries that are likely to suffer from increased heat mortality in the future are in purple on the right side of zero. And the countries in green, largely on the left side of zero, are countries where what you might uh, call temperature-related mortality is probably going to be decreasing, both due to the fact that it's going to get warmer, but warmer into a more pleasant uh, uh, climate in some sense at least from the point of view of mortality, a more optimum climate, but also greater adaptation capability. And then you have some cases in the middle. This shows you the difficulty that the world faces brought down to one particular part of the climate problem. That is, those. This is a, you've probably heard before, climate change is going to hit, hit those who can least afford to deal with it. Uh, with greater intensity than it's going to hit those who were responsible for creating the problem historically and have more ability to deal with it. And the death rates that are implied for the increase in death rates are quite significant. There are a few percent of total mortality, 
not total weather mortality. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you. I actually don't applaud yet because I left something out. There are the general lessons. <laughs> Sorry. You can't, uh, I'll do, adaptation to extremes can, can be learned, but it, ta it takes getting hit first. The obstacles are institutional and financial. I could give you several hours on each of those. And psychological, which maybe Elka can help me a little on. And the political incentives are all skewed towards responsive. Deal with an event after the fact. Don't think in advance. Thanks, Deborah, for the great introductions, and thank you all for joining us here today. So I'm going to just give you an overview of my lab uh, and some of the work that's going on at a high level, because I, I, I think in 10 minutes, I'm not sure I could dive into one study in great depth. Uh, but I'm hoping if there's one thing I do today that you go away thinking of cities differently. I hope you often think of cities not just as cities, but as urban systems. And so I'll explain what I mean by that, and that we get away from thinking of cities within a boundary, but they're these big networked systems that are impacting the globe at scale. And so I lead the Urban Nexus Lab, where our focus is on transforming infrastructure and food systems towards decarbonization, health, well-being, and equity outcomes. Uh, I, Deborah already introduced me. I just wanted to acknowledge these NSF grants that have supported the work um, over the several, I think, 10 or 15 years. So the, the first point I wanted to make is that urbanization is a key driver for global change. This was not the case uh, maybe even 20, 30 years before. So we've had extremely rapid urbanization. Um, you know, there's a common statistics that uh, more cement is used in China than was used in the entire, in, in, in one year than was used in the entire history of United States uh, development, and that is a true fact. It's, it's because of the requirement for urban infrastructure. And so this type of urban growth, um, by 2050, 70% of the world's population will be urban. Um, but what's remarkable is that two-thirds of those future cities don't yet exist. And so there's a significant opportunity. So while it's a challenge, like I mentioned, of course, you know, there is increase in consumption as different countries develop. And there's been very strong data showing that no country has developed economically without going through urbanization. So urbanization is a path to development. It comes with resource requirements. How can we make those resources and the energy and the materials environmentally friendly, decarbonized, but also addressing some of the issues here, for example, equity. 30 to 40% of urban populations in many cities, so that's 30 to 40%. It's an incredibly high number, live in informal settlements. So as we think of progress uh, towards decarbonization and <coughs> resilience and adaptation, it's also important to keep in mind, even within cities, what is the inequality within cities. So there's the transnational inequality that Michael talked about, and there's the rural-urban inequality that happens within countries, and then there's this intra-urban inequality that happens within cities. And so a lot of my group's work is in addressing these nexus outcomes. And what you see in the middle is actually a report I led uh, for the National Science Foundation um, I serve on their advisory committee for environmental research and education, and it's called Sustainable Urban Systems, Articulating a Long-Term Agenda. And that's the key message that we, in fact, you can see there. You can see a neighborhood scale. I don't know if you can see people bicycling. You can see sort of the whole city. But then the third picture is the view from space, showing that urbanization is now just transforming the globe entirely. And so there are statistics like uh, uh, water requirements for, for just 40 of the world's biggest cities are impacting 40% of the world's watersheds. 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from energy use in cities. And so the urban impact is immense, but the opportunity is equally immense. And uh, part of the reason I'm, I'm excited about projects we're doing at the Chadha Center and we want to do now that COVID has has diminished, I don't want to say past, is, uh, is that it would be phenomenally uh, impactful 
to be there when these new cities are being planned, to have a different model for thinking about cities that could translate to other parts of the world, particularly the ones that Michael just showed. In fact, this is a perfect segue of how do we think of cities in those parts of the world where urbanization is going to accelerate. So in my work, I focus on these seven key provisioning systems. Um, and I do that intentionally. And those systems are energy supply in red, municipal water supply and sanitation in blue, transportation in orange, food supply in green, and the materials that we use to build our urban infrastructure buildings and public spaces, I lump them together in gray. And the reason we focus, and this is slightly old, this is a 2016 paper with 2010 da data, uh, that these seven sectors collectively contribute almost 90%. It's actually the latest data is 94% of global greenhouse gas emissions. They contribute 97% of water withdrawals. And then on this side, you can see they contribute to a vast majority. Maybe I can use my arrow. They contribute here to a more than 20 million premature deaths. And these are deaths due to non-communicable diseases, but entirely caused by poor infrastructure, air pollution from polluting infrastructure, or inadequate infrastructure, lack of sanitation. And uh, the statistics are really uh, right. This is about 6.5 million back in 2010. Currently, 9 million premature deaths every year happen due to air pollution. And a lot of that is because we're urbanizing. We have high concentration of populations in these urban areas which, who are exposed to high concentrations of pollution. And so those numbers are really incredible. So the World Health Organization says one-fifth to one-fourth of uh, these premature deaths are caused by environment and infrastructure. So I mean, imagine if someone were to say one-fifth, <laughs> and you could actually improve it by better infrastructure, and yet we're relatively passive. If someone were to tell you 20% or 25% of premature mortality is because of these systems, I don't know. I think it would be a very big wake-up call. And so that's the message in my lab. Can we connect uh, health, well-being with the types of changes we want to see in terms of water sustainability or greenhouse gas mitigation and decarbonization? And can we also do that while addressing equity? And so this slide is just saying that the urban contribution, which I already mentioned, is, is exceptionally large. So 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with cities when you consider cities importing electricity, petroleum, and so on. If you were to include emissions from producing cement and producing food, that number is easily much higher. And so I just want to say how big of a challenge, but also how big of an opportunity urban areas and transforming urban areas systemically offers. So a lot of my work is anchored on a framework. Uh, so actually, I'm known to have pioneered the sustainable urban systems approach where we think of cities. And so this is trying to show the boundary of this one city. And within that city, you're seeing all those provisioning systems, right? So you're seeing energy, mobility, municipal water supply, food supply, sanitation and waste, green infrastructure and buildings. But very few of these provisioning systems can be sourced within a city. I think we all know that, but we appreciate it particularly. Not only did Hurricane Sandy sort of flood the subways, but we also had our supply chains disrupted. So food supply chains, fuel supply chains. And so there are these very strong teleconnections between cities and each other, cities and the rural hinterlands, but also cities globally. We're engaged in global trade. And so what happens collectively across urban areas impacts the globe. And so a lot of work in my lab is on creating the analytical methods so that cities can show their impact outside their boundaries. They can also show how climate impacts impacts them at multiple scales. And uh, in the end, we want to stimulate action across scale, from the home scale to the neighborhood scale to the city scale, but also to regional, national, and global scales. And so I work with the International Resource Panel of the United Nations, and we develop these sort of multi-scale models 
that could help nations think about urbanization um, as not only affecting individual cities, but how does it affect their national total goals? And uh, as you might imagine, different actors are motivated by different things. So sometimes it's livelihoods. Some, often within the city, people are more interested in health and well-being. Sometimes these transboundary impacts need to be governed by transboundary institutions. And that's where some of the challenge of how do we act collectively across sectors and scales comes in. Um, so I won't talk a lot about each of these, uh, but I want to just talk highlights, because these are examples of systemic learnings which have happened from individual cities, but they've allowed us to develop analytical methods that we could then translate to cities at scale. And the first one is just simply, how do cities measure their greenhouse gas emissions? So when I first started this work in 2000, 2000 or 2001 with the city and county of Denver, there were no methods for cities specifically. So they were just doing what countries do, which is measure emissions over their territory, which makes very little sense for cities because they're importing electricity, they're importing fuel, they're importing cement. And so the first city I worked with was amazing, an amazing knowledge co-production partner. And we came up with a new methodology to say, please at least consider the transboundary emissions from producing food, construction materials, um, fuels for your mobility, and of course, electricity, which cities were counting. But can you please count these additional things because you couldn't have life with cities? without these provisioning systems. So Denver was sort of a frontier forerunner city um, that actually adopted this transboundary approach. And that then was replicated across global cities. And uh, I'll show you in the next slide, has been institutionalized as the approach for US cities, as a preferred approach for US cities, all US cities. Um, so it was an example of doing something deeply with one city, but then actually having impact afterwards. The second was systemic efficiency. So oftentimes, when, when we do modeling at the national scale, the grid size is often bigger than the size of a city. And so many things that are important in cities don't get considered in these bigger models. And so here we showed that Chinese cities, the opportunity to exchange waste heat, we have so much industry going on in Chinese cities that that waste heat was actually sufficient to heat and cool almost all of their buildings with some to spare. And so these types of options could be substantial in decarbonizing and also creating local energy options. Um, I won't go through all of these, but we've done some interesting work on inequality analysis in Indian cities, saying what would it take to get the 30 or 40 percent who right now live in informal settlements to actually have a lifestyle that enables well-being for all within planetary boundaries. What does that mean? Um, in the US, we've uh, developed some methods to unpack income and race. Because I, I was often in these meetings in city councils or public health meetings. And it's a hard conversation to have about race and income. And very often, people would say, oh, but isn't it just an income effect? And I don't mean just in a minimizing way. but. It's, it was, we came back saying, well, let's look at the data and we, can we actually unpack it and show that there's a race effect that's distinct from an income effect. And it makes a difference when you share data like that with policymakers. So in future, we're trying to look at pathways to get to zero carbon cities with these climate proofing health and equity co-benefits. I just want to end by saying um, what I enjoy a lot is what I just described, knowledge co-production with cities. And this was just the example of Denver. Uh, what was nice is we got lots of scientific papers, many of them co-authored with our city partners. But we also got the city to adapt, adopt the method into their climate action plan. And then Denver promoted the methodology to other cities. And within a very short time, between 2007 and I believe this is 2012, that's just five years, this approach became the approach for all US communities, the preferred approach for all US communities to measure and report their greenhouse gas emissions. So I just wanted to say, while the science is great, the joy and the challenges of co-producing it 
with communities as, I think, a way to scale up impact and try to smoothen some of those in, you know, institutional barriers that can happen. And we're now experimenting with this at a, at a larger scale. And so I'll stop with that and just say that uh, uh, the idea here is transitions analytics to transform infrastructure and food systems, but doing it, co-developing it with communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah, for organizing this. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I also have a slide that I like to show, Michael. <laughs> it basically talks about the fact that we live in a time period we've called the Anthropocene, you know, to denote the fact that it's increasingly human decisions and human decisions related to energy, energy consumption, energy sources that are influencing uh, the quality of our environment. Uh, and the bottom line is we're not doing very well. You know, when it comes to sustainability and well-being, uh, it's well documented we're exceeding planetary boundaries on climate, but also other important uh, dimensions you know, every day, uh, while at the same time leaving large portions of the human population behind, income, uh, wealth inequality, energy access inequality, both within countries and uh, within, between, between, within countries and between countries. And the challenges, uh, but also a set of solutions, are well documented. You know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the IPCC reports that come out every five to seven years. Uh, and yet, you know, there probably is not enough action uh, on, on all of these fronts. Uh, when COVID came up uh, four years ago or so, people thought, well, maybe sort of COVID and how we deal with the COVID epidemic could be a, a, a lesson on how to deal with, with climate change. Turns out we didn't do so well on the COVID front as well. Uh, but yeah, so those are the, the two uh, existential challenges have a lot in common, yeah, as, as shown on the slide. Uh, they're both global issues that require international cooperation, rapid government and corporate responses, require behavior change, uh, upfront costs to avoid more serious but also more uncertain future negative outcomes. Uh, the, the risk and impacts are you know, sort of not equally distributed uh, with respect to demographics, with respect to socioeconomics. Uh, and the nature of the threat uh, is you know, not very amenable to action. They're both unobservable, in a sense, uh, at the time of decision. Uh, at least with, with COVID, you find out three or four days later whether you should or shouldn't have gone to that party. Uh, that was, ended up being a super spreader. With climate change, it's, it's worse. It's a matter of years or decades. And sometimes you never find out whether or not sort of your particular you know, action sort of had an impact on that. Uh, also, they're, they need to be therefore communicated with complex scientific models. Uh, and there's exponential pace of growth, which makes delayed uh, action very dangerous. So um, to uh, this last point about exponential growth, to react to it, and Michael already made that point, uh, that you know, we need to really sort of see action at a completely unprecedented scope uh, and speed uh, that we haven't seen in, 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 in human history. So just to show you one example, one of the maps from the Princeton Net Zero America report that came out last year to, to great national international acclaim, uh, it shows you know, the, the, the energy uh, uh, landscape around in, in, in Appalachia, around Pittsburgh, in terms of solar installations and in terms of uh, wind installations and transmission lines by 2050. And when you compare that you know, to what's on the ground right now, you say, holy smoke, how are we going to get there? Yeah. Uh, and so that will require, and this, this is just like one example with respect to energy infrastructure, you know, not to speak of all the other infrastructures we have to put in place for mitigation, for adaptation. Uh, this will require coordination uh, at different levels, at the governmental level, civil society, and the corporate level. And you know, not just action at these levels, but also coordination of action. Yeah, who's going to do that? How are we going to do that? Uh, well, here's where I come in as a psychologist. Yeah. What do we assume about decision makers in these policy discussions at all these different levels? Uh, assumptions about the consumer, but also assumptions about corporate actors and the private and public policy community. Uh, and that assumption is one of rational updating of rational choice. You know, homo economicus, a beautiful creature, relatively simple creature, uh, but uh, does not probably describe many sort of human decisions in, it, in their complexity. Not to say that we don't make rational decisions. We clearly have rational processes. It's a huge evolutionary accomplishment, our prefrontal cortex that allows us to do these things. 
Uh, we have the uh, hardware for it, but we have to program it. You know, we have to send our kids to college to make these kinds of decisions. Uh, what we have instead uh, is you know, uh, Homo sapiens. And, and how, do homo, how does Homo sapiens differ from Homo economicus? Well, oftentimes uh, uh, we deal with finite attention, with finite processing capacity. As a result of that, we are myopic. Uh, Michael already mentioned examples of that. We sort of only respond to a hazard after it occurs, even though we did predict it, yeah, but we didn't respond to it, we didn't act. Uh, uh, we decide by calculation you know, in this rational fashion, or maybe by shortcuts, but still nonetheless calculational. But we also make decisions based on our feelings and based on uh, rules of conduct uh, or social norms. So uh, we make affect-based decisions, uh, immediate positive or negative reactions, calculation-based uh, or role-based decisions where we have a rule what to do that comes oftentimes as part and parcel of our social identity. Uh, be, being a Christian, being a teacher, you know, we sort of know what to do, uh, standard operating procedures in companies. Uh, does it make a difference? Well, I just want to show you a study that shows that it does make a difference. But we now look at the uh, decisions made by uh, energy consumers. You know, um, basically uh, members of different utility companies who were asked to make a decision between continuing with the standard you know, sort of brown electricity uh, that they were getting or switching to green electricity, uh, which tends to be somewhat more expensive. Uh, turns out that green electricity is pretty popular uh, uh, across the political spectrum. Also in these two countries, we looked at both uh, California consumers uh, and uh, Swiss consumers. So you can see the two thirds of the population actually was willing to pay the extra amount of money you know, that came with green electricity. But then when we afterwards asked them to also indicate on these three different scales to what extent they had made that decision uh, based on sort of some sort of calculation based process, we described all these things in details and gave examples, or based on some emotion based process, or based on some rule, a role based process where we asked them what the rules or the roles were. Uh, you can see, and you put these you know, sort of degree to which you use these three different processing modes as a predictor in the regression about whether they switched or not from brown to green electricity. You can see that calculation based processes on the left hand side had a negative coefficient, they reduced from your willingness to switch. Uh, whereas you know, the uh, emotion-based or the rule-based processes increased your willingness to, 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 to make that switch. So why is there not more climate action at all these different levels? Is there uh, an information deficit? And I would want to argue that no, it's the knowledge about climate change is there at this point in time. Yeah, we, there's no information deficit on that uh, by, yeah, by and large. Uh, there probably is a information deficit on knowing what to do, what is the most effective action. And I think that's true both at the general population level. Most people think recycling is still a very good idea. There's nothing wrong with recycling, but it's not the most effective thing you can do. Uh, and, but also it's sort of in, in, in other sort of parts of the actor space. So I think there, you know, sort of more work needs to be done. Also, I want to argue there's uh, an information deficit on knowing what, how others feel about this issue. Uh, and let me just show you results of another study that came out last year where we asked a representative sample of Americans uh, to indicate to what extent they were endorsing these different policies, uh, of, you know, of paying a carbon tax you know, or re putting a renewable energy on public lands and so on. So these five different responses, we asked them what they would either endorsing that themselves, and what do they think, what percentage of other Americans, you know, other Americans and also other people in their state would be endorsing these policies? As you can see, there, you know, there's a super majority who actually are endorsing it in, at, at, this, at the US level, uh, but only about half of them thought other people sort of were also endorsing it. So as a result of that, you get the spiral of silence. Nobody talks about these issues because they think they're a minority, they're gonna get attacked, they're gonna feel embarrassed about it. So uh, in, on top of the uh, information deficits I talked about, there also are cognitive and motivational deficits, you know, myopia, uh, loss aversion that I've written about, and I, I won't say much more about that here. Uh, but also the problem with uh, climate change and other oftentimes uh, uh, sidle ha uh, hazards and, and uh, problems are the long time delays and the deep uncertainty about them. Uh, you know, we don't you know, really know sort of how actions will resolve in time and whether it's all worth it. And how do decision makers, again, from a psychological perspective, deal with that level of deep uncertainty? 
uh, if you don't know what to do and what's the right action is, we just basically observe others that we trust yeah, and who we think that have more knowledge. And there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in, in, in the wisdom of the crowds, following what others are doing. Uh, so adopting the beliefs of trusted others and the actions, following social norms you know, is, is an example of that. But that, of course, makes for partisan responses and for the political polarization that we see right now with respect to climate change. We saw it with COVID as well. Um, Another way in which we can deal with this deep uncertainty is basically using personal experience, experiencing uh, a, a, a huge flood. Yeah? And that, as Michael showed, doesn't just work at the individual level, also at the social level. Seeing is believing, and seeing you know, severe damage because you failed to do something will prompt you to do something like that. Uh, and uh, But of course, that makes uh, responses reactive rather than proactive. And as Michael was pointing out, and I knew as well, we need proactive action on this, in this space. Again, let me show you some results about how, uh, how these uh, two processes actually sort of work together. Uh, this is a, a panel study where we've been following 5,000 Americans since the onset of COVID you know, every few months, asking them about their concern about COVID uh, protective actions you know, on, on the COVID front, but also about climate change. Uh, their attitudes, beliefs, worry about climate change, but also their, you know, their personal uh, and, uh, and collective actions with respect to, to, to climate change mitigation and experience with personal consequences, extreme weather events you know, in, in, in their neighborhoods and the damage incurred by them. Uh, and uh, you know, there's no question that worry, you know, this emotional pathway, uh, basically making things on, a, on, a, on an emotion-based, feeling-based way out of fear, uh, does motivate action. So as you see for both climate change and for COVID, uh, the more people worry about these issues, uh, the more likely are they acting on this. And this is actions at all different levels, no matter how you measure it. You know, it's a very consistent relationship. Uh, there's also no question that this kind of uh, action coming out of concern is politically uh, polarized. You don't need a statistical test to see that these groups differ from each other for both hazards. Uh, but now what happens when you actually have also have personal experiences? You're not just following trusted others with the polarization, but you realize that extreme weather is actually hurting you and your community, uh, and COVID is killing your, 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 your family uh, and, and, and impacting you negatively economically. Uh, the more negative experiences people have, again, for both hazards, uh, the more do they worry about it, and we know worry leads to action. Mm -hmm. Uh, and does, how, does that actually help with political polarization? And so you'd find, uh, if you break down people's personal experience and their effect on worry and on action by political party affiliation, that the Republicans who before probably were much less concerned about climate change, uh, now all of a sudden get this you know, signal that says, hey, what I thought was a hoax actually is serious. You know? uh, and we know from learning theory, uh, that things that sort of that 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 surprise you have a greater impact get, get, getting to you revise your decisions, uh, and as a result of that, you know, sort of there's more change in worry, more change in action. So there is actually a decrease in political polarization. So uh, let me finish on this slide. Can can behavioral uh, solutions save the world? You know, the answer is no, not single-handedly. Uh, but they are making com important contributions. On the one hand, on one side, there's uh, actually a significant contribution from just demand side solutions that can be motivated by behavior change. And I did haven't had a chance to talk about that here. It's an important wedge uh, in the contribution to climate change mitigation. But also behavioral science-based implementation of other tools uh, can actually multiply the effectiveness of these other tools, whether it's uh, supply side innovation, yeah, sort of. Uh, 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 technological inno innovations need to be adopted by users. Uh, economic incentives, whether it's a price on carbon and a subsidy of renewable energy, how that is being uh, implemented makes a huge difference. Uh, and also legal mandates, efficiency standards or renewable mandates can be communicated uh, and implemented in very different ways. And understanding more about the, the abundance of processes, you know, not just rational calculation, but also the, the use of, of feelings and, and, and social norms uh, can make a difference in how effective these other tools uh, will change behavior and uh, will reduce uh, climate uh, gas emissions. So with that, I thank you for your scarce attention. <laughs> Great, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, colleagues. So nice to, to see you um, all here. So um, I will zoom in into the planetary nexus of Amazonia. 
and, uh, and I want to make a case for how history plays human, non-human relations, politics, and storytelling matters for us to get a more realistic and hopefully actionable social science for our worlds on edge. So, so the materials that I will present uh, to you uh, come from um, ongoing work that's being done at the Brazil Labs, various research hubs, especially safeguarding Amazonia and engaging indigenous ecologies of knowledges. And I'm deeply grateful to our interdisciplinary team, especially Mikael Mugi, Fabio Zucker, and Rigo Simon, the research associates that are here with us, um, but also Marina Irata and Karina Levis, wonderful climate uh, conservation scientists, uh, Pierce Global Scholar, uh, Amazonian anthropologist Carlos Fausto, uh, archaeologist Eduardo Neves, and our own Princeton uh, physical anthropologist Agustin Neves, uh, Agustin Fuentes, sorry, as well as uh, colleagues at Princeton uh, that we are engaging with in the Net Zero or uh, Net Zero Earth uh, America, uh, Net Zero America or Net Zero Earth as well. So, so as uh, as you know, I, I want to start with uh, basically broad description you know, of the Amazon rainforest, which covers uh, most of the Amazon bases of South America, you know, large um, territory uh, of which um, uh, 2 million 100,000 are covered by the rainforest. And the, the region includes um, uh, nine nations, uh, over 3,000 formerly acknowledged indigenous territories, if you think of Pan-Amazonia, right? So half of the planet's remaining rainforests, uh, with an estimated 390 billion individual trees and about 16,000 species, if you think of Amazonia. And Brazil has 60% of the, of the Amazonian uh, territory. It's an area, an area equivalent to 50% of Europe or the continental uh, US. Uh, as we all know, it's a hotspot of biocultural diversity with over 400 indigenous peoples and more species of animals and plants documented than any other ecosystem in the planet. Um, there are now in the Amazon region of Brazil about 22 million people, and uh, 180 different languages are spoken. And it is one of the most threatened geographies on the planet and a bastion also of potential sustainability for uh, biodiversity. And, and uh, later studies, as we showed towards the end of my talk, you know, show that it's no longer a matter when will the tipping point happen. There are already many tipping points uh, happening. And, and, uh, and the Amazon is actually becoming a uh, um, uh, carbon emitter rather than a major uh, carbon sink. So, so, um, so as you have been following in, in the media, you know, internationally and, and nationally, right? So we, we, we hear about the stories of wildfires in the Amazon, threatened global climate, has Amazonia reached its, power point, uh, its tipping point? We also heard more recently about what's happening with indigenous peoples, particularly the Yanomami, illegal mining, you know, uh, uh, renewed genocide of indigenous peoples under the Bolsonaro um, uh, regime. And, uh, and, and those are some of the questions that we have been wrestling with over the years since the Brazil Lab began. And actually, the first uh, major event we had, we called it uh, Amazonian leapfrogging. And the idea is, can we do something in Amazonia that does not go through that normal cycle of you know, extract, develop, and then you get to the other side, and then you're concerned with conservation. But that would not be the case, would not be possible with the devastation of, of, of the Amazon. So we actually worked together with Stephen Pekala, Elena Shevyakova at uh, uh, High Meadows and GFDL on a model on what would happen to the world without the Amazon. If we just took the Amazon out, what would happen to, uh, to the world? And this and these images show that, you know, so if we took 100% of the Amazon and turned it into cattle pastures, for example, uh, the global temperature would rise 2.5. Uh, and there will be a 15% less of rainfall in Brazil, affecting all kinds of agricultural uh, uh, patterns and, and practices, basically turning impossible to reach the Paris Agreement commitment. Just a sense, again, if you remove the Amazon, what would happen? And so to highlight, again, the importance of, of, of really uh, uh, addressing both conservation, but also socioeconomic development for the peoples of the Amazon so that they can remain you know, a bastion of, of biocultural uh, diversity. And I want to show 
this, uh, this brief video of uh, over the years we have been working on safeguarding Amazonia, Amazonia leapfrogging, but also engaging in scholars of knowledge. And we had the privilege of had of have with us uh, at uh, at the start of the academic year, David Kopenawa, the shaman and leader, and who, who who spoke to the Princeton community. And I just want to have a little snip shot where he connects again indigenous lives, wisdoms, knowledges with the protection of the Amazon, not just for Brazilian or Brazilian indigenous groups, but for the planet, for humanity. So just uh, a little view here, you can see the map going, you can see the increased deforestation, you know, since the, and this map goes from the, from the 80s when, when, uh, when Map Biomas was able to recuperate the satellite imagery first. You see how the neo-extractive development model of Brazil put into place since the, since the 70s, based on monoculture, basically soybean and cattle ranching, that forest fires plus hydroelectrics, right, illegal gold mining, you can see the borders of, 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 of Amazonia, the encroachment, and now in the past uh, few decades, you know, over 20% of the Amazonian range, Brazilian forest has been uh, deforested. So, but the amazing thing is that during the first Lula and, uh, first and second Lula administration, Brazilian scientists, environmentalists, and activists actually devised a way to control uh, deforestation completely, uh, um, uh, uh, out of out of control. So you see the incredible decrease uh, in the years 2004, 2012. Basically, satellite monitoring, law enforcement teaming up with public uh, prosecutors, financial instruments, credit limitation if uh, if deforestation was identified, creation of protected territories in certain certain states. Right. But then you see again during the uh, during the Dilma. <laughs> government, right, the 2010s, and then the, the Bolsonaro, Tim and Bolsonaro, the incredible uh, skyrocketing increase, again, in deforestation and the deregulation of environmental laws, demobilization of law enforcement, and then also the increased uh, or presence of organized crime in the region. And here's just like a modeling on the collapse of biodiversity, uh, which shows how the climate change and deforestation can cause a decline of up to 58% in Amazon tree species richness by 2050, one tree species lost every two days. Right? And then together with ecocide, you know, there is genocide, right? So it's happening. So you see the, one of the first things that Lula did when he came to power after the elections, right? So basically uh, started an inquiry, an open and probe on, on genocide against the, against the Yanomami. They themselves had taken their cause to international uh, 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 courts. But so you see the 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 threatening of the livelihoods and the territory of indigenous peoples guaranteed by the Brazilian constitution. But you also see the effect on hydro, of hydrolytic plants that they have in the, in the region, part of that you know, uh, development model, uh, again, reignited in the 2010s, flooding of vast areas, changing fish migration patterns, biodiversity loss, and all of this you know, leading to, to, to food insecurity for indigenous and riverbank communities. And here you see the, the, the graph here, like the, in Alto, the Boa Vista, Southern Amazonia, uh, the loss of 40% of forested areas, you know, during the period that we are talking about. But then also you see the soybean and the yucca and the impact that it has on, 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 on food uh, consumption and possible food security. Right? So this is, a, this is an image of the indigenous land of Sangradoru. And here's, here you see the encroachment of plantation and what's happened to the indigenous territory, right? So, so you see it's completely surrounded here by, you know, by, by, by that model of development, agricultural development, plantation. But at the same time, you know, in that territory, you know, they preserve the forest, but they 
but that something is happening to, to their ecosystem and to their, to their livelihood, right? So, so now, a Brazilian scientists, they, uh, Luciana Gatti especially, she did an incredible study, you know, it was actually in the New York Times Magazine a couple of months ago. Uh, she did a, a study in, uh, in, uh, uh, published, I think, in, uh, in Nature, um, where, she, where the question is that we are turning the Amazon into an accelerator of climate change. Instead of being the carbon sink, the preservation of biocultural diversity, it's becoming an accelerator of climate change. And she was able to locate in certain areas, particularly in eastern uh, Brazilian Amazon, the, those areas. And those are areas in which there is a, you know, you see climate of extremes already. Intensification of hydrological cycle, drier droughts, more intense floods, expanding of monocultures, right? Menacing indigenous food security. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you see this also, those tipping points already being experienced in other biomes, especially the, the wetlands, the Pantanal, the Brazilian wetlands, one of the world's largest tropical wetlands. In the last 36 years, it's just right beneath the southern Amazonia, uh, lost 60% of water uh, surface. And then you imagine the impact down south to South America, you know, to, 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 to Bolivia, to Argentina, et cetera. So in a nutshell, you know, 20% of the Brazilian Amazon have already been converted to other land uses. 17%, you know, it's, it's degraded forest. Uh, today, the Amazon is about, it's, it's warmer, higher than the global average. And you see those cascading effects of those tipping points triggered by deforestation, fire, and climate change. And then this striking image here, you see where where does the forest you know, begin? Where there are indigenous peoples. And they say you need to protect us because forest in pé onde tem indigenous. Forest standing where there are indigenous peoples. Right? And then together with that, you have this incredible phenomenon of, of an urban Amazonia. Over 20, to, over 20 uh, million people live uh, uh, in Amazonia, most of them in urban areas. 60 to 70 percent, high labor informality in those areas, you know, no, no, little job opportunities, homicide rates extremely high, and again, incentives to further uh, engage in, uh, in, in forest-based, uh, you know, uh, economies, uh, their deforestation, lumber, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Lula came to power, and I want to end with a few slides on this, and, and basically said Brazil is back, you know, Egypt at, at the COP. And, uh, and I think he really uh, is, is conveying a sense that he wants climate change and Amazonia to be at the center of, of his legacy. And then the question then comes, how do you decarbonize further? How do you make Brazil a green power economy? Economic growth is a key priority, but still reliance on commodity exports. Is there congressional and public support to make that happen? How do you nurture interest in forest-based economies and nature-based solutions, right? And we all know that technocratic solutions are not enough. Given the environmental and political challenges and opportunities, Brazil can move the sustainable need on a different register. And, and we want to, I want to highlight with these images um, this uh, sense that maybe more immediately Brazil is trying to postpone the end of the world. Marina Silva is back. An indigenous ministry has been, cre has been created in Brazil. There's a strengthening of law enforcement now in environmental and indigenous state agencies. There's an attempt to shield forest protection agencies from political vagaries. The question of how you, uh, how you trace supply chain commodities, but also how do you expand bioeconomy projects among uh, local communities, and how you restore Brazil's central place in global climate uh, diplomacy. And then one thing that Lula could do, and that really depends on, on political uh, pressure and public support for this, those areas in white are undesignated public lands and most threatened by deforestation, actually, 29% of the territory. So Lula could, with his signature, he could make the case, he will transform that into protected territories without the approval of the Congress. It might come with a political cost, but there are things that can be done immediately on the register of really protecting uh, 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 this, these territories. And we all know that deforestation happens in private lands, right? Indigenous lands are lands where the forest is uh, are standing. And, uh, and there's an incredible new uh, surge of studies 
really trying to engage indigenous ecologies of knowledges, you know, their own ideas of conservation, their own sense of, of sustainability, right? Because there is a tension in models of conservation. They tend to imagine them without humans. And, a new, and there's a new ecological framing emerging from, uh, from Brazilian scholars working on the Amazon. Indigenous activity has promoted biodiversity for over 12,000 years. The Amazon is one of the few independent centers of plant domestication. So there's agricultural innovation with the forest, anthropogenic fertile soils, the dark earth, relation between biodiversity and sociolinguistic diversity. So you don't need to annihilate diversity of customs, patterns, cultures with, you know, uh, with, uh, with agriculture and, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and kind of an urban life that indigenous peoples themselves created. In other words, social change and cultural homogenization plus language loss can engender biodiversity. So we need to bring people back to the conversation, especially indigenous peoples, to the question of, of conservation. And here is a study from one of our partners, Carolina uh, Lewis, which shows how forest abundance increased on areas of archaeological sites, of indigenous sites. So it's a very interesting study. And that raises the question, could some of those sites, now with new technology, you can identify them, could they become cultural nature heritage uh, sites in, uh, in Amazonia? So, Concluding, the Amazonian rainforest is shaped by ecological and cultural processes. The question of how to transform conservation research and reframe ideas of development from an Amazonian biocultural diversity perspective is a critical one that we are taking up at the lab. How to account for indigenous environmental services and to harness indigenous nature-based solutions. Not assume that the work that they are doing is for free. To rethink Amazonia as a natural courage, cultural heritage. The redirection of human, non-human perspectives and values can do something for that question that Elke was getting at. You know, is there something to be learned of a different way of relating to the environment, to the non-human that indigenous communities world over bring to us? Is there something like an ancestral future available to us? And given the country's energy, leapfrogging, know-how in halting deforestation and Lula's leadership, we could ask the question on a more positive note, could, could we think of a less unequal and more green and maybe Brazil net negative? Thank you. Thank you so much. So much incredibly valuable information. And the thing that struck me is that it's across disciplines, it's across sectors. So this idea of transboundary is, is very clear. And I'm just wondering what people think, you know, uh, the first presentation by uh, Professor Oppenheimer talks about you talked about some of the, the obstacles, including the institutional obstacles, which is obviously includes political will and financial resources. Um, how can we think about uh, transboundary institutions? Uh, so taking this idea across across scales um, that can address some of these challenges, and so. Uh, I'm thinking about this particularly at local, at the local scale. So uh, cities came up repeatedly in this conversation, but the reality is that cities don't make decisions in a bubble. They don't make the decisions for themselves. It's nested within, you know, uh, multi-scalar governance. But the way that our systems are designed are very siloed. So how can we think beyond these silos? Just the way we need to think across uh, disciplines and sectors. Any sort of recommendation there? And I was also struck quickly by the equity elements. Um, and nobody said this word, but I just think the justice word um, needs to be thrown out there because it's, it's, it's incredibly striking and we're doing terrible damage to marginalized populations locally and globally. Great. Thank you so much. We'll repeat that question at the end so everybody can hear. This was phenomenal. Thank you so much. So Professor Oppenheimer had a slide early on saying nothing updates belief like extreme weather events, right? And then Professor Weber said, OK, but then there's psychology that gets on the way of rationalist updating. There's something going on at the level of the individual that individuals might have a hard time translating their experience with extreme weather events with climate action. And fair enough. But then the other two papers show us that on top of psychology, there's politics that gets in the way. And there may be conditions under which, even if you have experience with extreme weather events, or even if you see the Amazon burning, the politics just gets on the way in a big way. 
And that would account for why on Earth, in particular in the global south, experience of extreme weather is not translating into climate action. And one should be developing theories to account for what's going on. I mean, one theory could be uh, it's all about clientelism. It's about clientelism because when extreme weather events hit and you need money for preparedness, voters in poor settings, they don't want to think about the future. They discount risk in the future. They want to bring it to the here and now. They would rather have some financial security now and not worry about the future. That could be one thing. Another thing could be you know, electoral design. Systems could be very unaccountable. So there is no incentive for politicians to develop a reputation for competence. Whatever it is, it seems to me the beautiful thing about this panel is that it shows what the problem is, how we need to get there, but psychology gets on the way and politics gets on the way. Now I think we need a theory that integrates how psychology and politics get on the way. Once we know that, then we can translate experience into action. Great. Well, if I could, just to recap and given the time to say, we really have three questions on the table if I can pull them together. One is how we think about this in a multi-scalar way, local, national, transnational, going forward. Second is bringing back the issues of inequalities and their experiences along various dimensions. And the third is the politics alongside all these issues, given that politicians are always navigating multiple sets of, of concerns, oftentimes have a two to four year time scale for making, uh, making differences. And so this challenge of bringing the politics into this with a theory. Can you do that in two minutes each? <laughs> Why don't I send it back? And what I'm going to suggest is pick up the part that seems useful or if you want to leave us with an additional question as we end with the knowledge that we will continue this conversation, um, hopefully in a future panel um, and outside of this one. So Michael, do you want to start off? That's a boatload of stuff to have to think <laughs> about. Um, I, I don't want to propose a theory. What I will say is that uh, there's a lot of experience around the world, and it's not all bad in all places in the same way at all times, and that there are good and bad examples. Um, if you, um, the other point I want to make is that the psychology, as I understand it, uh, forgive me of entering an opinion on this, uh, the psychology and the, the institutional problems kind of reflect each other. Or at least in the worst cases, they feed back in a, in a nasty way on each other. We, you know, in, in the United States, everything uh, I for in terms of uh, adaptation to climate change, in a way, there was no adaptation originally. So it was all disaster response. So that's a historical remnant. And you have to get beyond that. But that means we're stuck with a bunch of institutions. And they're very powerful institutions like FEMA and the US Army Corps of Engineers, which are focused on uh, ex post, uh, not ex ante. And how you, so it's, you have to fight, that means to reorganize that and reorganizing institutions. We don't do that very well. And that itself also is a reflection in part of the political two to four year thing that you mentioned. So you get these outcomes like uh, there's no incentive for someone who's running a city in the United States to do much, uh, or, or I won't say there's nothing done, and I won't say there aren't some incentives, but there are these heavy thumbs on the scale against doing too much to build resilience because, you know, the federal government, if there's a disaster, is going to come in and shower you with billions of dollars of money. That's the way the system works. So who wants to take a chance on building, spending money, tax money, to build resilience, local money largely until recently, uh, when, you know, that's going to weigh against you and you won't get any credit for anything because you may be defending upon, against something that will never happen. Uh, not in anybody's lifetime. So they, I just want to say that these are not separate factors. They not only feed into each other, but some of them are the result of the pre-existence of the institutions and arrangements that we've been stuck in for a long time. It's a very complicated problem to break apart. And I think the solution does have to do with largely with two things, going to the local level a lot to try to build from the bottom, but also one of the biggest problems is finance, in that it's centralized, and in most countries, certainly this country, the dominant revenue raising is at the central, the national government, but the responsibilities 
are at the local level, a lot of them. And somehow that chain, that relationship has to be torn apart and restructured. That's the first thing I would do if I were in, in uh, if I had any power. Which is a great segue to a new recognizing that we now have five minutes and you've asked each of you to answer questions that would take all day. So. Right. <laughs> well, great, great question. And I'd love to, to chat more. I think uh, maybe I'll just share uh, the experiences I've had. Uh, again, I'm not also in the realm of theory making, but I think there's an intermediate scale that I've moved to now, which is the regional scale. And those metropolitan regional authorities actually are responsible for infrastructure. They're responsible for spatial planning. Uh, the ones I work with most closely because I moved from the Twin Cities is the Twin Cities Metropolitan Council, which after George Floyd has really raised justice to your question and at all levels. And so I think it, that scale has allowed us to actually work with 182 communities from edge suburbs to suburbs to central cities of widely varying stripes that have come together in discussions. And it is still true that financing is important, but the Metropolitan Council is the funnel that funnels the finance. And so if, to me, that's the level, whoever's in charge of implementing infrastructure across multiple types of cities that allows you to scale the impact. And so, where we're going is, is really trying to replicate regional efforts so we can look at diversity of all types and inequalities of all types. I'll just stop with that, but I'd love to chat. Thank you so much. So, so at, at a sort of somewhat abstract level, we're dealing with a problem of multiple goals you know, and goals that come at different time horizons. And you know, a few people want to destroy the planet we're living on, but other goals get in the way. And other goals that oftentimes have sort of more immediate consequences, you know, whether it's you know, to get reelected you know, or, 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 or to make money you know, sort of off, off, off the current crisis. And uh, you know, sort of one hope is you know, that uh, a common enemy can galvanize the kind of cooperation that, that we're looking for. Uh, and you know, I, for a long time, I thought, well, climate change might be that common enemy, sort of the equivalent of the space invasion. But the problem is that the enemy is us. <laughs> and uh, that, that, that's an enemy that's hard to fight. Uh, and the other problem is one of attribution. Yeah? So if you even make, if you sort of, you know, experts know that climate change is at the root of many of these consequences that we are experiencing now and, and increasingly also in the global north. But you know, it's, it's easy enough to dismiss it because you know, it, it, there's no, no direct connection. Okay, no, thank you for the opportunity and also for the, um, the questions. Just a few scattered um, thoughts. Uh, I think the kind of analytic work that we are doing tries to create holes on dominant ideas of um, of, of the political, right? And, and, and in some ways, I think what indigenous peoples are doing in the way they are mobilizing themselves, given the stress, the injustices, the killing that is happening in their territories, right? So, 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 so there's something that they, they were able to mobilize the, the climate change agenda in Brazil. So, and, and that kind of enlarged the repertoire for us to think about, uh, about conservation, about sustainability. So, so, so if anything, I think uh, like, an, like an instinct that our kind of analytic work that we are doing for these various research hubs is to poke holes in the ideas that models or traditional ways of producing knowledges or even ideas of the social or of the political are fully given. They are not. You know, so, so, so I think there is more creative work that we can do in academia. And we need to engage with some of those communities who are doing that kind of creative conceptual political work, but also with um, groups of scholars and policymakers and scientists and activists who are mobilizing to produce knowledge in other ways than the traditional academic knowledge making happens. So I think they are the think and do tanks, incredible nonprofits, you know, they were at the forefront of producing alternative knowledge that made possible the, the system of, of mapping, surveying, deforestation in Brazil. So, so innovation is coming from other quarters. And, 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 I, and I think the 
in terms of the political that you ask, uh, Matthias, if we look at, for example, the, the, the struggle to decriminalize abortion in Argentina, completely unlikely that it would pass. pass. But the activists, the feminists, they kept doing it. And, and I talked to the leader of, of, the, of, the, of the movement there. She said, we, we keep doing things. We keep collecting our weapons. And when time comes, we will do something. So it's very interesting. So, so, when, so the t it's not a teleological way of changing the political. I think that's at stake here. And, and I think the, the idea of Lula just you know, endorsing the, the, those 25% of the territory and granting it uh, a status could be a big bang of sorts that could do something. So that's one way of doing it. But I think there are other ways as well. But I think it's up to us to kind of try to see where creativity is already unleashed on the ground and see how our models could catch up of thinking the social and the political uh, uh, and conservation uh, with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So before we give um, our panel a round warm of applause, really it was a phenomenal, phenomenal panel. I just want to highlight a couple of things. One, the beauty of the research that's being done here, but the connections to people on the ground in other places, not only to understand, but to be forward thinking, publicly engaged, and engaging in this kind of radical imagination that Joao just talked about um, and that has come up in some of the other panels. I want to highlight, though, as a political scientist or who's not on the panel but just introducing them, that on the one hand, radical imagination has to be part of it, the sharing of knowledge, whether or not it's science or moral or cultural or what have you, has to be part of it but always in the context of recognizing the political and the material constraints. And today we've talked a little bit about the political. We haven't really talked about the material constraints associated with greed um, and material conditions that might create enormous obstacles to preventing change. So it's not just creating one narrative that we can all agree on, and it's not just getting politicians on board. It's also about overcoming obstacles in the context of a system that benefits some over others. And so this has to be part of the, of the conversation as we go forward. I want to thank the four of you for a phenomenal set of presentations and for sharing your work with us and to all of you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you.